here at NIH, and, and we recognize that the biggest audience that we have are PhD students, postdocs, uh, a whole smattering of, of, of people, many of whom never studied pathology or histology. Some never took biochemistry. So what this clinical investigator does is talk in like scientific American terms, you know, things that any intelligent person can grasp onto. Because the purpose of this whole course is to excite. It's not to have you fill a notebook full of things that somebody's going to ask you to memorize. So it may be things like changing epidemiology, how do we know when somebody has what we're talking about, and you know, where do things stand in a somewhat low key. And why that individual happens to be here at the NIH spending their productive years doing the research that they do, okay? And then the second speaker is usually a leading basic scientist who relates what do we really understand in a reductionist sense, a molecular, you know, whatever sense of what's really going on with this disease, what do we know, and what are the challenges? And the emphasis is on challenge because most of the people who come here take this course. They know all the current technology. Uh, they know a good bit of genomics, informatics, a whole sort of it. They know a great deal about it but they know very little about human disease, what it looks like, what it feels like. They know words. Anyway, I don't want to belabor this point, but I hope you get the, the, the message. And you're all welcome, of course, to go to the website, and uh, you can download the program for the year, all the PowerPoints, uh, all the references, which are up to date and usually have one or two good reviews of the topic and some CV information about the speakers. And many times, people in the audience contact the speakers, and sometimes striking things have happened. Postdocs have even changed laboratories, uh, which has gotten back to me, as <laughs> maybe not always. So, at any rate, uh, today apparently we have an added feature, which we don't normally have, and that is this uh, session is being uh, filmed uh, by the Discovery Channel. Uh, uh, this is part of a relationship with the clinical center as part of the effort to make the public more aware of the incredible things that go on here. Because in general, I don't think the public is very aware of the amazing things that go on here. Uh, we're constantly having friends who are not in science, but very accomplished in their own field. You ask them, what's the NIH? And they tell you it's a big building where they hand out money. I mean, they, they have no idea of what goes on here. All right, one other uh, brief announcement. Uh, now, this has all been changed. If you go to the uh, uh, schedule, uh, these changes that I'm mentioning are already there, so there's nothing new. But due to some confusion, we had to change things around. So today's topic of atopy is today on the 16th. And on the 23rd, uh, Jeff Cohn uh, and Lysia uh, Drapolik are going to talk about shingles, herpes zoster, and some really incredible progress and advances being made in that uh, uh, very serious disease. And then the program that was scheduled on the oral microbiome, meat cell biology, and periodontal disease, which was originally to be on the 16th, uh, will be on the 23rd, 29th of March. And that's all in the program, so you don't have to do anything about it. OK, uh, I just want to say one or two other words. Uh, Today's topic is one that I, I think represents uh, several major interfaces in medical research. Uh, a, a lot of what we do in medicine starts out with epidemiology. 
And people argue whether epidemiology is a hard science at times or, you know, but it gives a clue as to where to go. But the media don't necessarily take that broad view of epidemiology. They treat it as fact. And the reader treats it as fact. So we're readers. So one of the things I hope we will have some consideration is, uh, are we living at a time when allergic diseases, atopic diseases, are almost like an epidemic? Uh, is asthma really an epidemic disease now? Uh, are the risks of asthma, if you're born by cesarean section, really significantly different if you're born uh, by vaginal delivery? Uh, there are a whole host of these epidemiologic considerations that reach the public media. And I think we have an opportunity today with two experts in this field to hear their opinions about some of this and help put it into some perspective. Because it's the public image that often drives a political image, a budgetary influence, and all sorts of things, which may have nothing to do with the underlying science. So we are very fortunate because we have two uh, uh, experts who are going to be speaking with us. Uh, and I guess, Josh, you're going to speak first, right? OK, so uh, Josh Milner is chief of the genetics and pathogenesis of allergy section in the Laboratory of Allergic Diseases in the NIAID. Uh, He's a graduate of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. That was my home turf for 30 years. So he's a prize graduate of the Albert <laughs> At any rate, uh, Josh is a leading immunologist whose attention has been directed toward trying to understand sometimes rare disorders of allergy and uh, atopy uh, at the genetic level, the genomic level. And mechanistically, what, what do those genes do? You know, is all of this a T cell business? Uh, is IgE the common denominator for all kinds of allergic, all kinds of things like that? And so uh, Josh is going to begin and discuss that. And then our second speaker is our relatively new arrival on the NIH campus, uh, Pamela Guerrero. Uh, who got her MD and uh, PhD from Johns Hopkins. And uh, she is interested in uh, genetics. Uh, she's trained in pediatrics, had a fellowship in allergy and immunology at Hopkins. Uh, and her work is concerned also with basic mechanisms and trying to understand what, what's going on particularly with regard to food allergies, one of the more common kinds of allergies about which I, as a layman, <laughs> find totally confusing when you know I read, again, much of what's said in the lay press and people speaking about things that they don't know the hard science of. So we're very grateful to all of you, particularly to you folks who have come and been willing to uh, tell your story. Everybody here is involved in science in some way or another, except for the photographer, perhaps. But <laughs> photographers these days have PhDs in molecular biology sometimes, so I have to be careful. At any rate, uh, so this is all, you know, sort of within the family. Uh, your privacy is completely respected. Uh, people will hear your voice. They will not see your face. And we welcome you very much to share with us what you have learned about your disease, because that's really where it starts. OK? So Josh? All right, so we're, we're very excited uh, that our family is with us. Uh, Sharon, Brian, Stephanie, and Scott. Oh, Sandra, sorry. Apologies, Sandra. 
See, I, I met her for the first time today. Um, <laughs> so, um, and these are three generations. Um, and uh, they're going to just give us a, a flavor of a number of the things that have been going on with, with Scott, uh, who was the patient who was brought to our attention a number of months ago, uh, and who will really serve as the, uh, the anchor for the, all of the things that we're going to be talking about, uh, at least that I'll be talking about for, for, the rest of, uh, for the rest of my talk. So if, if Stephanie, if you could just give us a, uh, a flavor of what you first noticed and how things played out with respect to, to Scott's allergies. Okay, well, Scott um, has always been our conundrum child. Um, you know, when he was about two, we, had, we took him in um, to have him evaluated for autism because he just seemed a little off compared to the other kids. And they diagnosed him with sensory integration disorder. And then from there, um, you know, we also noticed that whenever he had eggs, he would get really sick. And then he had eczema in the different, um, on his arms and legs and things like that. So we saw a dermatologist who sent us to an allergist and um, he had the scratch testing done. He, um, and they said he was allergic to um, eggs and dogs, very allergic to dogs. A, do a golden retriever would lick his face and his whole face would blow up. Um, so he has always had issues with allergies. Um, so he, uh, <laughs> and uh, what, what kind of thing would happen when he would eat the egg? He would throw up. As soon as he would have egg, within 20 minutes, he would throw it up. If he touched egg, even if it was just like baking with grandma, and grandma touched an egg, and then she would touch a spoon, and he would touch a spoon, and then touch his face, his whole face would swell up. And uh, what other kinds of things happened with respect to him eating? Did he have difficulty eating uh, after Sometimes a certain time? Sometimes when Scott would eat, um, he would choke a lot. And we always just thought that what he had was a so small esophagus because his dad and his grandfather always said that they had small esophaguses. So taking medicine like pill form or eating certain things, he would have a lot of difficulty swallowing it. And did that cause pain also? Absolutely. So he, he was, uh, we always called him our expert vomiter because he could, he could vomit with the best of them. So, I mean, he just knew how to like get it up if need it be, if need it, he could always make himself throw up. And uh, were there any other things? So besides you mentioned the, the, the behavioral uh, differences that you noticed, um, were there any other things that, that didn't seem to you to be as related to allergy that you noticed as well? Absolutely. We had him um, tested for um, ADHD. Um, we had him, we even spent a couple thousand dollars to have him uh, tested educationally for um, processing, uh, all sorts of stuff, because there was just something always a little off. And so he was diagnosed with ADHD, more of the, um, uh, the ADD more than the hyperactivity part. And uh, with his eczema getting really, really bad, um, it also led to depression where he just was a very unhappy person. In fact, a couple of years ago, we went on vacation out of the country and his eczema got so bad, it was like head to toe, he was red, that um, he didn't want to come out of the hotel room. So it was the most miserable vacation in a tropical paradise because he didn't want to come out. And when we did go to the grocery store in that country, they all thought he had like some kind of, what was the virus they thought? Chicken Gaia? Chicken Gaia. So they were all kind of looking at him funny because he just was so red and. Um, so, and then uh, anything with um, his skeletal system that you noticed that was different? And a few years ago um, during one of his uh, checkups, um, he was his doctor noticed that his spine was curved, mm -hmm. so he also so now he sees a um, orthopedic doctor and has to wear a back brace at night for scoliosis. And Scott, I understand that uh, that you can do some interesting things with your joints as well. Could you share one of them very quickly, but <laughs> without getting everybody? Can you do anything with your with your thumbs or your fingers or make a sound with them or anything like that? Um, like this. Do that again. I don't know if you can hear it, but at will, Scott can make joints pop in and out. Um, so, um, <clears throat> okay. And uh, Dad, did, did some of the things that went on with Scott ring any bells for you? Yeah. Um, I tell my wife that there's no question of paternity with him. Um, he, it's, 
you could tell he has a lot of the same traits as I do and as my father had. Um, and so the allergies are all allergic to a lot of the same things as far as shellfish, uh, seafood, uh, nuts, um, even um, chicken. Um, and everybody we talk to, nobody's allergic to chicken. We're allergic to chicken. <laughs> and um, so there's a lot of food allergies on my side of the family. Um, and uh, again, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, the uh, the assumption that we had a narrow esophagus because we had problems with doing uh, swallowing issues and then um, doing scopes. Um, those were difficult uh, whenever we had to have upper endoscopies. Um, and so uh, there was just an assumption that we had, um, we all have the same allergies and we all have the same throat issues. And there was, it's just something we have to deal with and we have to live with and that there's nothing really we could do about it. So um, it's sad that we've passed it on to Scott. <laughs> and Sandra, you, you had said that you also noticed some things both both in 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 Brian and Brian's dad that, yeah, that rang a bell. And, and in fact, even just an hour ago, uh, you had pointed out uh, right. some extra things. Could I you... think I was, I think I probably came to the realization first that it was EOB or esophagus. EOE. E mm -hmm. EOE, uh, because just the way he threw up was like the way grandpa did with all that mucus. And then, um, Scott had depression a year ago, mm -hmm. and I Brian had depression about that same time when he was that same age. We mm -hmm. all got into therapy together and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I know. <laughs> okay, um, and then so um, Scott came here, and we we um, admitted him for a wet wrap therapy to try and really get his eczema more under control. And then while he was here. Uh, we talked about uh, the issues with swallowing, that we might have an idea as to what was going on. So uh, can you just give us an idea of, or even Scott, tell us, does your skin feel better now after that was all done? Yeah. Yeah, all right. And then um, what did we do about your throat? Did you take um, a medicine, a specific medicine? Um, yes. And then, and then they had to look, they had to do a, an endoscopy to look and to see if there was anything wrong to begin with. And they said there was. Then you went on the medicine for a while. And remind me, how many foods can you eat right now? How many different foods do you eat? I'm really not sure. Is it somewhere around five? More than that. Oh, more than that. Okay. It's maybe about five to ten foods. So, so there are five to ten foods that you eat. For period. Um, and and because it's hard to to swallow, and because of the concern for allergies. <clears throat> so after you went on the medicine, uh, then what happened with your swallowing? Um, it got better. Yeah. So is it is it easier to eat now? Yeah. Are you looking forward to the possibility of being able to have 11, 12, or 13 different kinds of foods? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. And mom, how, how was that experience for you? It's been, uh, you know, whenever we would get a prescription, Scott would always ask for it in liquid form because he hated anything in pill form because it was always so hard to swallow. And now he doesn't throw such a fit if he has to take um, a pill or something like if he gets a headache or something like that he doesn't get upset about having to take Advil or something because you can swallow it now and it's not such a big deal as it was before and so between his skin and his his swallowing would you say his quality of life has improved oh absolutely it's like he's finally happy and it's so nice having like a regular kid again instead of one who just wants to hide in his bedroom and want nothing to do with anybody. He's seeking out his friends again and having his friends over. He's not hiding. So it's 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 such a relief to like have a have like a regular kid again, like all my other friends, instead of having one that just wants nothing to do with anyone. All right. Well, thank you very, very much thank for your time. <laughs> Okay, so um, our family uh, gave us a good number of, of bits of information that hopefully I'll be able to refer back to as I'm talking, uh, and, uh, and both in terms of the allergies that we sort of know about, and then perhaps some elements that we didn't necessarily think had to do with allergic disease. Um, so the outline that I'm going to go through is, first of all, try to define an allergy. I don't think that'll happen. Uh, in a short period of time, but we'll try to, find, to define an allergy, <clears throat> how they happen, and how we treat them. And again, this is just 
just the highlights. I mean, you know, this will just be scratching the surface. Um, we'll ask why do we have allergies? Why, well, now that uh, Dr. Arias mentioned if they are and why they're on the increase, um, and then finally get into the way that we're beginning to approach these questions um, from a genetic point of view and ask how our ability to understand genetics, which now in this day and age is so fundamentally different than it was even 10 years ago. We can get insights we thought we would never have. Um, and so we'll give a few examples of those of folks who've been taken care of here. Um, and again, see how perhaps our family might fit into that. So what are allergies? We can break allergies down into immediate type of allergies and chronic allergies. Colloquially, you know, you say an allergy and that just means something, you know, it bothers. I'm allergic to school, right? I am allergic to shopping. Uh, and that's the type of thing, but we sort of need to get a little more precise about it in order to talk about it. So anaphylaxis, when someone drops their blood pressure and um, their throat begins to close, that's the most severe form of allergy. That's what scares us. That's what can kill people. Um, breaking out into highs within four hours of a food or a drug, that's a pretty classic manifestation. Getting hay fever, that was probably the first description in lay terms, hay fever, uh, it was uh, they, they were getting sick from hay, but what actually what it was is they were having an allergy to, to hay and, and now to, to everything else that's in the air. Um, lots of asthma attacks, but not all asthma attacks are allergic. Something called the oral allergy syndrome. So I can guarantee you there are folks in here who thought they didn't have too many allergies, but sneezed a lot during the uh, fall or the spring, um, and then suddenly found that when they ate a raw mango or a raw banana or some sort of a raw fruit, um, that their mouth started to burn and they might even get hives around there. I see nodding, so I know this happens to some folks here. Um, and that's actually your immune system being tricked into thinking that you're seeing pollen when all it is is that you're eating a raw fruit. And if you cook it, it's all better, right? I think those who have it would be able to say. Um, and, and then the vomiting right after eating a food. I put a star there because, again, if you, you know, it tasted really bad, you might just puke from that. Um, <clears throat> but um, there are allergic reactions which would cause you to regurgitate the food immediately. Then there are the chronic kinds of allergies. It's the same machinery for the most part, but it's causing a chronic inflamed state that is sort of there all the time. Allergies can make it a little bit worse or better, but you don't have a response just like that. Okay, and eosinophilic esophagitis, which was described very, very well um, in Scott, is that sort of a thing. You're not having an immediate reaction to the food. You're having a difficulty swallowing because of allergies to all sorts of things have created an inflammatory state in the esophagus, which is actually not so different than that chronic inflammatory state that the skin can have in eczema, which would be another example of a chronic allergy. Um, there's something called, and this because I know that we run into this all the time, protein proctitis or protein proctocolitis, where you see blood in a baby's diaper because he's having cow's milk or because mom is having cow's milk and then and breast feeds, feeds it to the child, and it's very, very scary to the parents. So this gets called an allergy. Um, it's not really using the same machinery at all as most other kinds of allergies, but certainly the parents will say, my child cannot have milk or my child cannot have eggs. Uh, the nice thing there is that after about a year of age, you grow out of it and it has nothing to do with breaking out into hives or having any other severe allergies. But it's very important because people will call that an allergy. Um, something that I wanted to describe also is remodeling. So a lot of the times this chronic, you know, you remodel your house and over time things change a little bit. Well, that's what happens also when you have a chronic allergy is that the inflammation actually changes the room that the allergy is happening in. So uh, in your lungs, remodeling actually makes it that you start to lose progressively your lung function. Uh, and so in the, in, in fact, also when you get uh, allergic rhinitis, when you get hay fever, that also can change over time and be fundamentally different even if you're no longer exposed to the allergen. Uh, things which are not allergies um, are lactose intolerance, uh, celiac disease, when people can't have wheat, that's just a different arm of our immune system. Almost all drug reactions are not allergies. But yet, when you look on a patient's chart, or when you look in your own chart, you will find a whole list of things which will, they'll call allergies just because they don't know what it is. It was scary the first time. Let's not try it again. 
okay? But allergies have a specific response to allergens, which we can all discuss what that means. Um, that type of response is not what most drug allergies are. Getting reflux or heartburn because you're having chocolate or something like that is not, for the most part, an allergies. Um, getting joint pain from eating things. Also, these are different parts of the immune system which are being activated. Uh, and importantly, at least half, if not more, of food allergies when a mom or dad comes in and says, this child is terribly allergic to milk, 50% of the time we find out that was not the case. Okay, Something happened, we know something happened, but that allergy which we swore up and down was for sure happening in our child is actually not present 50% of the time. Okay, Other types of allergic symptoms, just good old fashioned hives. Walking around, I break out into hives. What did I do? I was just walking. I, nothing happened, and I broke out into hives. Stress is a great way, and we'll talk about that, a great way to break out into hives. Chronic itching with no explanation, probably parts of the allergic immune system are being activated. Getting flush in your face or in your skin, um, although also just being embarrassed, that can happen, but also where there's no real trigger and suddenly you get flush in the face. Certain kinds of abdominal pain are happening because your allergic immune system is doing stuff to you, even though you may not necessarily be eating something to which you're allergic at that time. Okay, um, And then, uh, indeed, a drop in your blood pressure. That's anaphylaxis, and we'll explain why that happens in a second. So how do I know I'm allergic to something? Well, you can be pretty sure if within four hours of eating a food, getting a drug, especially an IV drug, you break out into hives and your throat starts to close. You can be pretty sure that that was an allergy. Or if your nose starts to run and you wheeze at the same time every single year, um, or every time you go to that house, uh, your nose starts to run, um, exception can be your in-laws, um, then when that happens, that too is likely to be your allergic immune system that's acting. It's not something happening all the time. And those are, uh, that picture is a great uh, representation of hives. <clears throat> now, when do we start asking questions? Wait a minute, I don't think this is an allergy. How many folks have had it either for themselves or for their child because of one reaction to something? Um, their doctor, who was doing their best, drew 300 different tests for allergies or tested them to about 100 things on their back um, and said, guess what, you're allergic to milk. And you read that report while you're having um, pizza and yogurt and having a cup of milk or something like that. You should be skeptical that you're allergic to something when you're sitting there and eating it without a problem. Okay, so so often, unfortunately, we go on fishing expeditions to find out what we're allergic to when really, I always say, if you can't tell me what you're allergic to, chances are I can't tell you what you're allergic to. And that is a pretty good rule to have to avoid getting stuck with tests that say things that don't make a lot of sense. These are some of those tests. Um, on the top are skin prick testing, where a little bit of that allergen, it's been very carefully um, put together and standardized. There are actually volunteers out there who standardize the strength of the allergen for the FDA. They are the designated people. They go prick like that, and if it stays within a certain size, it's good. If it's too small, they're going to have to happen, ha have it again. And if it's too big, it means it was too potent. And there are people literally, that's their job. That's their job. And uh, again, these tests are there to determine whether or not you're allergic. And the one way is to actually introduce it into your skin. I should point out, about 50% of the time that someone has a positive food allergen, it's wrong. Okay, So you only do that test if you really, really think that it's that. And you don't do that test if you're just trying to guess what it is. Uh, why that is, we don't know super, super well. Um, you can also look for allergic antibodies, which I'll describe in a second, in the blood. Um, but again, those tests, those tests, uh, there are literally hundreds you could do, um, but there are only a few where it can actually predict for, you, predict for you the chances you will have an allergic reaction when exposed. Okay? There are only a few of those. I think there are only about five or six of those tests where I can say this test level gives you a 50% chance or an 80% chance of failing a challenge with that particular food. Um, we also can literally challenge the person, and challenge could be here, eat the food, let me watch you and see if you have a reaction, or here, inhale the allergen and see if it causes you to wheeze, or here, no joke, stick it up your nose and let's see if it starts to make you sneeze. <clears throat> I didn't have one just now. 
excuse me. Um, and those are all ways that we can test. And, and actually, those are the more real life ways is to actually directly challenge someone. The gold standard for diagnosing a food allergy is to watch something, someone eat that food. That's the gold standard. Um, interestingly, it only works if I don't know what the food is that I'm giving you and you don't know what food you're getting. Because believe it or not, if one of us knows, then the accuracy of that test drops. Okay, Tells you how much the brain can mess with the allerg allergic immune system. And that's something we'll discuss um, a little bit. Um, on the bottom is something called patch testing. That's if you're looking for something that gives you something called um, uh, a topic, I'm sorry, um, um, contact dermatitis, right? You get um, a rash right above a belt buckle because nickel gives you an allergy. For those for whom that's an epiphany, I'm, I'm glad, no problem, I can, I'll charge you later. Um, but uh, nonetheless, there are contact things which by touching your skin causes inflammation. They're not really allergies. They're not quite, you're obviously, you're not gonna anaphylax to those things you're having contact to, and you can't really test them by doing a skin prick. You actually put them on the skin and it sits for 48 hours and it takes about that long to have a response to it, if you're gonna have a response to it. So that's patch testing, and it has limited value. Okay, how do these allergies happen? Again, these are just the highlights. Uh, you have the obligatory picture of somebody sneezing. Um, so IgE, the antibody IgE, which is here. We have antibodies that can fight infections. Uh, we have antibodies that, that coat our, the lining of our, of our gut, like IgA. Um, and IgE, its purpose is not 100% clear in humans. It's not 100% clear. But we know what it can do is cause a pretty bad allergic reaction. So we need to take a cell called a mast cell. The mast cell contains within it all sorts of things that when the mast cell releases everything inside, causes allergic inflammation and allergic reactions. The most famous one is histamine. Histamine is inside of a mast cell and it's released immediately and that's what you take an antihistamine for, okay, is histamine. Um, the blue is the histamine, okay. Um, I'm not a graphic artist, but, uh, but bear with me. So on the surface of the mast cell is a receptor that can recognize IgE and IgE specifically. The, the, the bottom end of IgE down here is what it recognizes, just like that. On the other end of the IgE is, is what it's specific for. So in this particular case, we've got you're allergic to peanut. This is not drawn to scale. Um, you're allergic to peanut, and when peanut comes along, and you happen to have IgE antibodies that are specific for that peanut, then the receptors signal, uh, and that causes the mast cell to release what's inside of it. Okay, that's, that's cl classic immediate hypersensitivity. You already have those antibodies. They're already sitting on the mast cell. You're then exposed to the allergen and you have an immediate reaction because the contents of the mast cell have been released. Histamine and a number of other contents. When histamine acts on your blood vessels, it can cause um, them to become, uh, cause the skin, the whole area, to become swollen. They're swollen because the, bud, the blood vessel has become leaky and it's because it's dilating, okay? So fluid is rushing out, it becomes leaky, and then also the, actually the, the diameter of that vessel increases. So that lets more blood go in, that's where the inflammation, that's where the redness comes from, that's where the swelling comes from. Uh, and then other mediators that are in there are acting on nerves that are right there, and those nerves are detecting those mediators, and it's causing you to scratch, it's causing you to itch, okay? Um, so that's where, depending on where that is, you can get highs if it's in the skin or itchiness. If it's in your nose, it'll cause you to sneeze because you're getting the inflammation there. Um, if it's in your lungs, it'll cause you to wheeze. <clears throat> your nose could run. If it's in your belly, it might cause you to, to vomit if it happens very quickly. And if all of your blood vessels are dilating and becoming leaky at the same time in your body, your body cannot keep the pressure up. That's anaphylaxis. Okay? So what do we do? We give antihistamines to try and block the histamine from acting locally. We give vasoconstrictors sometimes, like Sudafed, to uh, make the blood vessel tighter. Um, there is a drug that, that doesn't use, is not terribly effective in most cases, but there are certain areas where giving a mast cell stabilizer like chromalin can actually stop that mast cell from releasing even if it's being tickled. Um, there is a drug called omelizumab, which actually blocks the ability of IgE to get to the mast cell. 
And so we can, omelizumab or Zolaire can block the IgE from ever getting to the mast cell, and it can be very effective in treating asthma and in treating chronic urticaria, chronic hives. Um, and then antigenic tolerance. Being exposed to the thing that you're allergic to in the right way can make you no longer allergic to it. That's what allergy shots are. And Dr. Guerrero is going to explain a little bit more about that, um, about how also we're trying to give it by mouth and also make you tolerant to whatever it is. OK, so that's an acute allergic reaction. The IgE on the mast cell makes the mast cell release everything, and you have those responses immediately. Then there's allergic inflammation. This is the chronic state that can happen that can cause that eczema, that can cause chronic asthma, that can cause eosinophilic esophagitis. And a bunch of different players are present. Here's our mast cell with the immediate, the immediate reaction. But things likely start here with a dendritic cell and a Th2 cell, a helper T cell that makes a certain set of cytokines, of messengers, to other cells that say, go initiate an allergic reaction. Why that Th2 cell decides to become a Th2 cell, it was naive, it was a freshman in college, it didn't know what it liked, it took some music, it took some uh, uh, literature, but it decided to become an allergic cell. That's obviously an, an active area of research right now. <clears throat> but it graduates and it becomes a Th2 cell, and it makes the types of messengers that create the environment for allergy. They can create the environment for allergy by making a B cell make IgE antibodies as opposed to other kinds of antibodies that can produce the allergy. Um, it can make IL-5, which promotes eosinophils, which is another type of allergic cell, which gets into the esophagus to cause eosinophilic esophagitis. Okay? Um, all sorts of things can be released. GATA-3 is a transcription factor that's the master regulator of Th2 cells. And I circle it only because there are now drugs that target GATA-3, interleukin-5, and interleukin-4 that in trials can actually prevent allergy or treat allergy. And so I'm just showing them there as areas we can treat. Leukotrienes, which are another type of um, mediator released from mast cells, also can, they're, they're, we can block those as well, and they prevent some of the inflammation that you can see. So again, some of the things that get released lead to chronic allergic issues, and the other, air, the other things that get released lead to acute allergic issues. For the most part, things start right here, where your T cell, which was naive, decided that you should be a, a T cell specific for that allergen and cause an allergic reaction to that allergen. Corticosteroids, so I told you that all the different ways that you could treat uh, uh, reactions, but the truth is, is that the most famous way to treat an allergy is corticosteroids. Um, it was, used to be called, I think, adrenal factor. Um, and it was noticed almost 100 years ago that it didn't stop an allergic reaction, but it would prevent future allergic reactions. And it acts on a whole variety of, of mediators um, chronically to prevent allergic issues. The problem is you can't stay on them because it doesn't work super well. And actually, it was a cortic an inhaled corticosteroid for a brief period of time that Scott went on that made his eosinophilic esophagitis go away. Um, so this just gives you an idea. You have an uninvolved skin. Allergen comes through and makes itself a Th2 cell right here that releases all sorts of master regulators that can get IgE made, that can recruit all sorts of other cells to come in. Scratching itself can release something called TSLP, thymic stromal lymphopoietin. You can actually upregulate a molecule, which will turn on your allergic immune system, actually by acting on the dendritic cell, just by scratching. Okay? And so we often say that if you can stop someone who has eczema from scratching, it's the scratching alone that's making 90% of the disease. It's the scratching. And part of it is because the actual scratching turns on your allergic immune system. There was probably some bug that it was a good idea to scratch. And we don't see that bug anymore. And so we're left with this system that makes us have an allergic reaction. We'll, we'll touch on that. When things get inflamed enough in the area, you don't need the allergen there anymore. You can have inflammation just from being exposed to the bacteria that are always in our skin, that are always around in our nose. They alone can promote this allergic inflammation without having to see the allergen anymore. So it has to be treated differently. That's the microbial toxin causing their trouble. OK. <clears throat> now, but wait a minute, doctor. You gave me a wonderful list of drugs. I took antihistamines and steroids and Zolaire, all these other things, and I am still itching. Well, the bottom line is that no matter what allergists say, we really don't always know 
exactly what the story is. So there's much more room for us to, for us to uh, advance the science. Why do we have allergies? Well, it's been thought classically that parasites, worms, since they're too big for any cell to gobble them up, you have to send a bunch of things at them to kill them. So, so exposing worms to histamine and other things inside of mast cells would kill those parasites or cause your digestive system to expel those parasites. That's the classic thought for why we have what's called a type 2 or an allergic response. But we can have responses to all sorts of other things. The classic idea was that we had to fight some sort of bug that was, you had to release all of these different things that cause allergy to fight that bug. There's been a bit of a different, um, not a different, but a complementary theory that's been put forth, which is it's not just about fighting the parasite, but it's also about getting rid of foreign bodies. Okay? Dust gets into your eye. If you itch, you'll get that dust out of your eye. If the tears get made, it'll flush that dust out of your eye. If you swallow a toxin, if you have a quick reaction to it, you'll throw it up before that toxin gets into your body and messes with your brain. Okay? So it's an interesting theory. We don't have perfect proof for it, but there's an interesting theory. And there's a very interesting example. There was actually a drug that was being given for cancer that on the very first dose of getting that drug, people were having anaphylaxis. And it did not make any sense. You should have that drug more than once to ever have an allergic reaction. You need to see it twice, almost always. Well, there were a group of people who were having anaphylaxis every time they got the drug. And interestingly, this only happened in Virginia, North Carolina, and a little bit westward at the beginning. So that's interesting. It was only happening, so maybe a bad batch was getting into the mid-Atlantic states. That's not what it was. Every person who said that they had the allergic reaction, at some point in time, someone was paying attention and heard them say that they were allergic to meat. They were all allergic to meat. And what it turned out is that meat had in it a certain glycosylated, a, a place where sugar is put on a protein. It has in it this glycosylation, which we don't have. And it caused an IgE response to the meat. And that's what the antibody was made in a cell that made that glycosylation event, that put that sugar on the protein. And what carried that glycosylation around from the meat to the person was a tick, the Lone Star tick, which was only around in Virginia, North Carolina, and westward. And so having an allergic reaction to the tick was probably a good idea. Because if the tick is there and you scratch it immediately, it can't give you whatever tick-borne virus that you might get. If it sits there for a long time, then you might get sick. So it's an advantage to, to, to notice and to have an allergic reaction to that tick. The disadvantage is you might not be able to eat meat, and you can't have cetuximab, which is this drug that could save your life for cancer. So it's nonetheless a really interesting story where here we have an allergy to protect us from a tick, from actually causing a problem. Another way that's been shown is that if you get bee stings, okay, uh, you can have an allergic reaction to a bee sting. There's no doubt about it. But actually, the venom from the bee sting is what usually kills smaller animals. It's not an allergic reaction. The venom from the bee sting is what's killing them. And there's actually some very interesting data that you need to have that IgE, and only that allergic antibody will work to go and bind up bee venom after that first sting so that if you got stung by six bees later on, the IgE would go bind it up, and you wouldn't have an allergic, you would not have a fatal venom reaction, a toxic reaction, not an allergic reaction. So it's there to protect us, even though we can also have allergies to bee venom. Okay? So those are pretty interesting examples of why we might need to have those allergies, but for some reason it goes awry. Okay. Why are they on the increase? To answer the question, yes, they're on the increase. Yes, we hear about more on the web, and yes, hearing about it on the web gives people allergies. No doubt about it. But nonetheless, it is definitely true that as time has passed, there are more of almost every type of allergy um, that we have. And the big reason that everybody gives is the hygiene hypothesis. We avoid the bugs that we used to get when we were younger, and keeping our immune system occupied with those bugs prevented us from having our immune system do the things that cause allergies. Okay? And so, oh, we don't like hand washing. We like our, the kid uh, wallowing in dirt. Um, another thing that has happened because we're afraid of allergies is we stopped introducing solid foods when babies were young. And Dr. Guerrero will discuss that avoiding those solid foods when babies were younger actually made it worse. 
we got more allergies because we were avoiding solid, solid foods when babies were young. The Western lifestyle, we're exposed to the wrong bugs, we're exposed to the wrong foods and the wrong chemicals. You can have the child wallow in dirt all you want, but if that dirt is in the middle of New York City, it may not contain the right bugs to keep you from having allergies. And then there's something else about Western lifestyle that I thought it was important to point out. I had a patient say that to me. Dear doctor, Xanax is the most wonderful antihistamine I've ever taken. Now, they then pr produced a paper that showed that the drug actually might inhibit mast cells. Okay, fine. But the chances are that's not how it was working. The chances are is that the stress was being mitigated. Okay, their stress was being mitigated and that's why they weren't having as bad of reactions. And stress now is different than stress was let's say a thousand years ago, okay? I actually love this uh, comic from the New Yorker. Everything was better when everything was worse, okay? There were things that got us much more stressed a thousand years ago than the things that get us stressed now. But it seems to be it's the things that get us stressed now that cause the allergic issues. So being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger was not nearly as stressful as having to go to your mother-in-law's house. I, I keep harping on that. I love my mother-in-law. It's just, you know. Anyway, um, and so getting up here and speaking is worse than an electric shock, according to a recent study where they shocked mice or, oh, this, what am I talking about? They shocked people. Um, oh my goodness. The, the basic science is, is for later. They shocked people or they made them get up and give a speech just like this. And they looked at the intestinal permeability in the people who were shocked versus the people who had to give a speech. And there was increased intestinal permeability, basically like IBS, okay? Pain in the belly from being nervous from the speech, but not from the shock. Those are two very different kinds of stressors, but only one of them seems to cause the kinds of problems that you might see. And it actually, there is reason to believe that it's mast cells that are mediating this permeability, okay? Because mast cells, can actually be exposed to certain types of steroids that make them release what's inside them very easily. And treating, and the reason why we think this is because here's the person they're giving the speech, this is their intestinal permeability right here. If I give them chromalin, which stabilizes those mast cells and prevents them from releasing what's inside, their guts are no longer as permeable. It's rather remarkable, okay? So not only have the bugs changed, but the things that stress us out have changed too. And that may also be contributing to our allergic diathesis. Okay. All right, the microbiome and allergy. Again, these are the types of bugs we see. Dr. Guerrero is gonna discuss them at length. I just thought this was interesting. I went to school with this woman and she's written a book um, about the dirt cure, growing healthy kids with food straight from soil. Okay? And I'm sure that part of that is that it's the bacteria that you're keeping on there instead of Purelling your apples. Okay? Um, now. How do genetics contribute to allergy? Let's get into some examples of how we can study the genetics of allergy to learn about the allergic immune system. So here's one thing I'd like to throw out there as a possibility for why allergies are increasing. And that is, well, the genes for allergies were always there. We just changed our environment. The genes were always there. It was, allergies would have always run in families, but we had to leave the farm. We got off the farm, we weren't exposed to the same type of bugs, and that is what brought out those genes which would lead to allergies, okay? These are not new genetic diseases. Or, for those who needed it a little bit, a little bit differently, when Taylor Swift moved from country music to pop music, okay? Same thing, same thing. Now, um, skin, the skin, and the skin barrier, thank you, Scott, for laughing, I appreciate that. Um, the skin barrier, um, is supposed to be this nice watertight barrier that keeps things out and keeps the water that's in. And uh, there are actual, this, it doesn't just sit there. It's dynamic. It's turning over all the time. That's why we shed skin. That's why we never lose our skin after shedding our skin. It's always turning over. And there are these little pieces of glue throughout the skin or pieces of brick, which the glue sticks to, that keeps the skin as nice and waterproof and preventing things from going in. And actually, if you bring up the pH, like by certain kinds of soaps or detergents, that actually makes this glue eat itself and fall apart, okay? Well, there are genes, tons of genes, that control this glue. Um, there are genes that, again, they, they make the brick. There are genes that make the glue. There are genes that eat the glue. 
such as proteases, and then there are inhibitors of the genes, pro protein products, which eat the glue, so as to not eat the glue all the way through, okay? Um, one of those genes, for instance, is LEKTI, which encodes for SPINK5, which is one of the inhibitors of proteases. If you don't have that gene, then the glue eaters can go to town. And this is what it looks like, okay? That patient on the top right is missing that one gene in SPINK5. Um, interestingly, he got IVIG and got all better. That does not work for most folks, but I just thought I would throw that in there. Uh, another gene that's in there is something called filagrin, and filagrin is just one, is part of the brick. And when filagrin is mutated across the common population, there might be only 50 people in the world with SPINK5 mutations, but in the common population, mutations in filagrin are quite common, and having them increases substantially your risk for developing eczema. Um, one thing that we can do then, with a lesson we can learn from that, is that we need to protect that barrier as much as possible. And so this is not Scott, this is someone else, um, who we treated by literally creating a barrier for them. We give them um, uh, a bath, it gets them moist, we put steroids on it, we put um, other types of emollients like Vaseline, and then wrap them up like a mummy. After that, for a week, they come out looking like the Gerber baby, okay? Because we've improved their barrier and it let them get better on their own because then they are, this is how this is bad eczema, let's just put it that way, and it, for like a year, it can stay pretty decent. Uh, just by getting that barrier back in shape, it has nothing to do with the immune system. It only has to do with the structure of our skin. Eczema herpeticum, or getting an eczema infection when you also have, um, when you also have eczema, it's interesting. It seems to be a genetic disease. You have mutations in something called the interferon gamma receptor 1. If you're completely missing the interferon gamma receptor 1, you die of viral infections. But if you just have it not working as well, you get eczema herpeticum. And that's a specific gene that you could actually target to prevent eczema herpeticum, as opposed to just saying, oh, that kid happened to, get, happened to have bad eczema and happened to get eczema herpeticum. We don't have to say anymore, oh, it just happened to happen. There are a number of disorders which we've begun to study where one gene Mutating one, one gene led to allergies. It also leads to lots of other stuff. So we get clues from those other things, like scoliosis, or like depression, or behavioral differences that give us a clue that it might be a syndrome. And Dr. Guerrero is gonna talk about one of them soon. I'll just mention very quickly um, a couple that we've found. This is called PLAD, PLC Gamma 2 Associated Antibody Deficiency and Immune Dysregulation. A baby was born with this. That's what got the medical attention. But the way that we solved the problem was that, well, the baby's nose, thank goodness, got better after three years. But that same baby, if you put water on his skin, caused a hive as it evaporated off of his skin. So the tear caused a hive, or just scritching out uh, um, a sponge of water right on the back immediately caused a hive. They had allergy to cold. There were other issues that caused the inflammation that led to that, that nose lesion that you're looking at right there. Um, but the, the answer was in the fact that everybody was allergic to cold. And the problem we had was that these patients said, oh, I thought it was normal to itch when it's cold. Doesn't everybody itch when it's cold? And that's why nobody ever figured out that there was something running in their family that was a specific gene that led to this entire syndrome. So they can get evaporative cold or to carry from birth, they can get immune deficiencies, they can get autoimmunity, or they can get nothing but the cold allergy. And that's what threw people off. And uh, we learned a lot about signaling just from studying these patients with, with, bad, um, with bad allergies and the mechanism. We could talk about it at another time. Um, another disease here where they got terrible allergies, bad infections, neurologic issues, delays, scoliosis, and other problems. You're hearing a, a theme, um, although this is not at all um, what, what, what's going on with Scott. Um, and they can have a number of problems in their laboratories. These are two different families that have it. Here is you're looking at scoliosis and bad eczema in one of the patients. And his mutation was in a gene called PGM3, which control, controls glycosylation. Now, I know most people here are PhDs. When MDs learned about glycosylation, that was a wonderful time for self-reflection and sleep. But nonetheless, now we had to learn about glycosylation because the patients were showing us something that was important about a specific pathway. A specific pathway which told us that about a gene that prevents allergy, PGM3. And what it does is it prevents actually putting sugars on proteins. On, on specific types of proteins and an O-linked glycosylation. Um, it's low inside the cell, and what's really important about finding this is that we can fix it 
by putting in more of the sugar. And actually, there's a clinical trial happening right now to supplement these patients with N-acetylglucosamine. You can pick it up at any GNC, and it's almost exactly what we did. Um, and those patients with this genetic disorder are being treated because we found the gene. And the question, of course, is how many other patients are out there with, that, with that, not as severe of a mutation, but enough to cause problems with the pathway and cause allergy? Could that be a new way to look at allergy? And finally, so in addition to the allergies that we saw with Scott, there was one thing that was a little bit different. He had a high tryptase, and tryptase is one of the mediators that you find being released by mast cells. It's stable, so you can measure it for a while, and then usually it goes back down after an allergic reaction. But in Scott, it was up all the time. His tryptase was up all the time. And it's also up in his dad. And if we could draw it in granddad, we'd find it up in his granddad as well. Because what he had was something called familial hypertryptosemia, which is what something we're, we've been working on um, right now. And it can lead to a variety of symptoms of mast cells constantly emptying out what's inside and other issues which don't make quite as much sense. So recurrent flushing and itching and swelling like angioedema. Hypermobile joints retain teeth or scoliosis, which we heard about. Anaphylaxis and eczema and asthma, asthma and food and drug allergy, which we heard about. Episodic pain in the belly, um, IBS, eosinophilic esophagitis, or colitis, which we heard about in the family. Tachycardia, feeling uh, 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 that uh, your heart is uh, palpitations. Anxiety and depression, pain, fatigue, and brain fog. But there's nothing wrong with their bone marrow. There's nothing wrong, there's no, there are no mast cells that are going crazy in the bone marrow. Um, you can actually get them to flush by, by just putting their arms on a vortex. Please don't try this in the lab. God knows what you put on that vortex. Um, this is just an example of what that hypermobility can look like, okay? And this runs in the family. And we only found it because we happened to draw tryptase in a few original families. Just this one family initially, and then we said, huh, who knew that having a high tryptase could be something you could inherit? And everybody in the family who had the high tryptase had exactly the same symptoms that I just showed you in the list before. So we kept asking folks and drawing their tryptase, and we found more, and we found more. Oopsies. We found more. This is a partial list. We found about 50 families. We have 160 patients. And they all have the same issue of having a high tryptase. Many of the symptoms that this family has just described to you. And um, actually, uh, it runs as a, a monogenic and autosomal dominant trait. And what's also interesting about that um, is that, turns out, 4.5% of the population has always had a high tryptase at baseline. That's just where we decided to make the cutoff. And it turns out a huge percentage of those folks have many of the symptoms we discussed. Maybe not every one of them is as severe, but lots of them have the same types of symptoms just for having the high tryptase. And what we're fairly sure about in the lab is that every single one of them carries exactly the same gene causing it. So by getting to the bottom of this familial inheritance of something that we just thought was totally sporadic, we thought that the eczema was sporadic. We didn't think it had anything to do with the scoliosis or the depression or the fact that dad and granddad had issues with swallowing or with their bellies. And by families like them and many other families, we found that there really is just a single gene causing this issue very commonly. It's not a rare disease. Okay. The last thing I wanted to mention, my mentor for four years was Dr. Bill Paul, um, who many of you may have heard of. I'm sure many of you have to use his textbook as the, the fundamental immunology is the textbook of immunology. And he passed away just a few months ago. Um, he was like a father uh, to me. And Bill Paul's claim to fame, for those of you who don't know, is just that he discovered IL-4 the cytokine that mediates allergies. It's fundamentally important for making an allergy to happen. He called it B-cell uh, growth factor. Um, and he just found, this is the original paper in JEM in 1982. He described IL-4, and that was the basis for enormous amounts of research into the fundamental reason why we have allergy. And I just put it up there because in the past year, we've had, in the past several years, We've had trials come out that show that by blocking the receptor for IL-4, we can block some of the most severe allergic diseases that would not be able to be treated in any other way besides perhaps terrible immune suppression with steroids. And that all becomes because of the bench work of Dr. Paul from 30 years ago. So I will leave it at that. These are some of the wonderful folks who work with me um, and, and, and are just absolutely fantastic colleagues. 
and I will answer any questions. Uh, so my question is in regards to um, variety of, of um, allergies and r specifically somebody who's allergic to pollen is not as not as allergic to pollen as somebody else. What are the causes of that other than genetics? So so there could be genetics, there could be environment, right? There could be the type of bacteria that person A lived with is different than the type of bacteria that person B lived with. And importantly, there's something called imprinting in the immune system where something during a critical window, and we don't know exactly when that is, when you got exposed to that pollen, either it made it more or less likely that you would have a severe reaction to, right? Maybe you had a virus at the time you first got exposed to that pollen, and it was different than if you didn't have that virus when you first got exposed to that pollen. So it could be critical early life events that just happened to be you were on the wrong bus at the wrong time and, and, and that time, in addition to the genetic explanation. Questions, anybody? So what's the relationship <coughs> between allergy and autoimmunity? Ah, so very important question. And actually, it gets confused very often by patients. Autoimmunity, we define for the most part, is the body's immune system, immune system attacking itself. Allergies, for the most part, we believe, is the body, body's immune system and really the, specifically the allergic arm of the body's immune system attacking something foreign, okay? Can you have an allergic response to yourself? We're still not sure. Does eczema actually cause T cells to have an allergic response to skin? People have said maybe that's a possibility, but that tends to be the fundamental distinction, both foreign versus self, and the type of the immune system that's causing the inflammation. So are you, uh, maybe Pamela's going to talk about this, but you want to say something about asthma as an allergic disease? So asthma uh, is, can be an allergic disease, and it can be a, a thing of its own. It's hypersensitivity of the, the lungs, of the lung lining, of the, uh, of the airways, um, and allergens can trigger it, but other things can trigger it as well. So it, it's the, the result is the same uh, when you're wheezing, but the trigger can be very different. It does not have to just be an allergen that causes it. But getting allergic, it's the same way getting allergic to your nose or to the food allergy. It's just the place where it's happening is in your lungs. Yes. Yes. Hi. I'm just wondering, um, so you use tryptase as a marker, but it's also an enzyme. And uh -huh. are you thinking that something that um, maybe enzymes that the mast cells are releasing are then uh, damaging the collagen? Yes. So that's a great point. And how do we put together the fact that there are allergies going on and you're having scoliosis and you can pop your, your, your joints in and out and all these other sorts of things. Mm -hmm. How do you put those two things together? Well, first of all, we thank the, 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 the patients and, 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 and the genetics for pointing that to us. That's step one. Mm -hmm. But step two is indeed tryptase and a lot of other things like it that get released from mast cells can eat away at the collagen mm -hmm. or change the collagen. And if it's been going, off your, going on your entire life, it could change the fundamental way that your, joint, your joints and your bones get made. So if you would maybe catch it early enough, you, possibly you can prevent some of the Potentially, that's right. If we could get to the bottom, that, if, we, yeah. if we could target that gene specifically, perhaps all of those issues would not happen. Would that stop everything that's going on in this family? Can't really be sure yet, but we'll have to try. So where does allergy appear in the phylogenetic tree? <laughs> Uh, I don't, Bill used to tell me this and I don't know the answer to it right now. Um, it goes, it, it's, it's in mammals. Um, there is IgE in lower beings as well. I don't remember which, I want to say, I, I can't remember. Uh, I don't remember how far, how, how far back it goes. I'm, I'm not asking whether fish have asthma, but right. what I mean is, is there something comparable right. uh, in, other, in the reptiles? I, um, I mean, mast cells are old. So they have yes. mass, mass cells. cells are very old. Um, so some form of it probably is. Oh, sorry, yeah. Ah. Uh, so for the things that are not allergies that we commonly call allergies, like um, say reflux or something like that, how do those 
what systems are changed right. in those, and, and, and what would you still see an allergist or you know, yes, good question. Right. So um, it's going to be hard for you to know beforehand before you go to the allergist who tells you thanks for coming, but you didn't need to see me. Right. Um, or maybe your doctor, your primary doctor, would know mm, if you're getting reflux. Chances are an allergy is probably not causing it. In some cases, it could be possible, but most of the time it's not. Or if you're having those belly pains and all those other issues when you're eating wheat. At celiac spruy, that's not really the department of an allergy. It's more of an autoimmune problem that might be a rheumatologist that would take care of it. Um, and so it's really often it's the primary care doctor who is aware of the different types of reactions you can have, what looks more like an allergy, and what doesn't look more like an allergy. Because the management is, and the reason why it matters, is the management is completely difficult, different, and what you need to be worried about is completely different if it's not being caused by an allergy. Are, are there any efforts to? Is there a way to think of reprogramming these IgEs to not? So Dr. Guerrero is definitely going to discuss that. But absolutely, there is. when we have tolerance to things like getting allergy shots, we believe we're getting a different part of the immune system to attack the allergen and box out the IgE, to use a basketball term. OK, well, I think we should uh, proceed with Dr. Guerrero. And there'll be time afterwards for more questions for Dr. Milner. So as Josh has alluded to, the pathogenesis of allergic disease really seems to involve both a genetic predisposition as well as exposure to several environmental or lifestyle factors. We know that variations in certain genes involved in different arms of our immune system, both adaptive and innate immunity, as well as the intestinal and skin barrier can all predispose to allergic disease, including asthma and food allergy and eczema. However, several environmental factors, including microbial exposures, vitamin D insufficiency, and in the case of food allergy, the timing and route of food introduction can also play an important role. In order to maintain tolerance, the immune system not only has to tell the difference between self-proteins and non-self-proteins, it also has to tell which of those non-self-proteins are harmful and which are innocuous, and those include the environmental allergens. This is an issue at really all barrier sites relevant to allergic disease, including the skin, the respiratory tract, and the GI tract, and it's really no small issue. For example, the human intestine is exposed to over 30 kilograms of food protein each year, and it has to know not to react to all that antigen exposure, which is all foreign. The, the answer is that we still don't completely understand the mechanisms by which tolerance to these innocuous antigens develops. But in the case of oral tolerance, food antigens are thought to be taken up across the lumen of the small intestine, where they're transferred to these dendritic cells that are marked by CD103. These cells then go to a lymph node in your GI tract called the mesenteric lymph node, where they present the antigen to naive T cells. These are those T cells that are still in school that Josh was alluding to. In the presence of certain cytokines and factors, including TGF-beta and retinoic acid, these cells turn into a type of immune cell called a T-regulatory cell that specifically recognize that particular food. And these T-regs, as they're known, are able to suppress an immune response to that food when you're re-exposed to it. So when you eat the food again, you have these T-regs in your gut that prevent your body from reacting to it. Through mechanisms that we still don't yet completely understand, some failure in this process can lead to the development of these allergic TH2 effector cells. And these are the cells that then promote Ig protection. They cause the recruitment and activation of all those other inflammatory cells important in allergic responses, like mast cells and eosinophils and basophils. For the longest time, TGF-beta has been realized as one of the most important players in the development of tolerance. Yet most of that information really has come from mouse models, and we don't really know if that's relevant to humans until very recently. So Josh was uh, talking about how monogenic diseases can really give us some insight into the pathogenesis of these very complex disorders like allergic disease. We recently had the opportunity to ask what role alterations in TGF-beta signaling may play in the pathogenesis of allergic disease. So patients with Loewy's dietz syndrome have mutations in genes encoding the receptor for TGF-beta, either the first or second subunit. This is what TGF-beta binds. LDS is a relatively rare connective tissue disease and was initially characterized by a triad of hypertelorism, which means widely spaced eyes. The patients develop cleft palate, and they have a split or bifid uvula. 
and they also develop aneurysms and tortuosity throughout the arterial tree. However, we had subsequently realized that these patients are also at highly increased risk of developing nearly all forms of allergic disease. So in our initial cohort of almost 60 consecutive LDS patients, we found that just under a third of them have been diagnosed with eczema, over 40% with hay fever and seasonal allergies, just under 40% with asthma, almost a quarter with food allergy, and 10% with eosinophilic esophagitis. These rates are significantly higher than what you see in the general population. Consistent with their allergic tendencies, LDS patients tended to have very high IgE levels, while their other immunoglobulins were pretty well within the normal range. The majority of the patients also had increased eosinophils in their blood. So as I showed you in that picture earlier, one of the most important cells that's involved in the development of tolerance are T regulatory cells. And TGF-beta is thought to be the key player that induces the development of these cells. So we quantitated their frequency in blood from patients with Loewy's Dietz syndrome, as well as people who had allergic disease but did not have any known genetic disorder, and then age-matched non-allergic controls. And as you can see here, we actually found more Tregs in people with Loewy's Dietz, as well as with people with allergic disease who didn't have a genetic syndrome, compared to their age-matched controls. This increase was primarily in those Tregs that expressed only moderate levels of a protein called FOXP3, which is needed for Treg development. This result was not at all what we were expecting because Tregs are thought to promote tolerance and clearly our patients were showing a loss of tolerance. So we thought about two possibilities. One is that this increase in Tregs was a compensatory response to all the allergic inflammation in these patients. The second possibility is that the Tregs just weren't working right. So one of the hallmarks of a T regulatory cell is that they don't produce effector cytokines. In fact, their job is to suppress cytokine production, inflammatory cytokine production by other T cells. However, we found that all subsets of Tregs in our patients with LDS, as well as people with allergic disease who do not have LDS, produce the allergic cytokine IL-13. And this was not seen in non-allergic controls. We also saw an increase in another uh, type of inflammatory cytokine called IL-17, but did not see an increase in interferon gamma, which is really involved in different types of immune responses, sort of the opposite or converse of allergic disease. So these data suggested that even though allergic people, including those with LDS, may have more Tregs, these Tregs may actually be promoting rather than inhibiting allergic inflammation. Our studies with this rare disease, with Loewy's Dietz syndrome, has also taught us that mutations in just a single pathway, in just the TGF-beta pathway, may be sufficient to predispose to allergic disease. And we think that could have really important therapeutic implications for allergic disease, which has such a complex etiology. So one of the things missing from this picture that we think is very important in the development of tolerance are microbes. Again, not drawn to scale. So while there are fewer of these in the small intestine, the large intestine is home to over 100 trillion bacteria, comprised of over 1,000 different species. And now there is more and more data that these bacteria play a very important role in not only the development of tolerance, but the pathogenesis of allergic disease as well. One of the first hints that this might be the case came from germ-free mice. These are mice that completely lack bacteria. So all of us have bacteria that normally live in our skin and gut and really throughout our lungs, really everywhere. But these mice have none of that. They have no commensal bacteria. And these germ-free mice actually spontaneously develop high Ig levels. They also fail to develop oral tolerance, so they get worse anaphylactic reactions if you can make a mouse allergic to a food. And if you make a mouse allergic to uh, an aeroallergen and they get asthma, they have more inflammation in their lungs than mice that are born and bred under normal conditions, what we call specific pathogen-free conditions. However, if you colonize these germ-free mice with a mixture of bacteria, specifically during the neonatal period, you can actually prevent this predisposition for them to develop allergic disease. The rise in prevalence of allergic disease over the last few decades has really been coincident with significant changes in our diet and more and more data is suggesting that these dietary changes may be altering the bacteria that normally live in our gut in a way that's actually promoting allergic inflammation. 
Our current westernized diet is not only high in fat and sugar and salt, but it's also very low in fiber. And there's data now that this simple single dietary change may be sufficient to increase the one's predisposition for developing allergies. So Trump et al. did a study in mice where they took adult mice and they put them on either a low fiber diet, which contained only 0.3% fiber, compared to mice on normal mouse food. So that contains about 4% fiber. And then what they do is they actually have the mice breathe in house dust mite, and that induces inflammation in the lungs that's very similar to asthma. So when they did this, they found that mice on the low fiber diet showed much more inflammation in their lungs than mice that were just on normal mouse food. These mice had more eosinophils and lymphocytes in their lungs, which is very similar to what we see in people with asthma, and they had higher Ig levels. They also had, again, more indications of an allergic response. They had higher of these IL-4 cytokines that Josh talked about and other Th2 cytokines, including IL-5 and IL-13, as well as an IL-17. And importantly, they had greater airway hyperreactivity, which is one of the hallmark findings in asthma. So just suggested that simply putting a normal mouse on a low fiber diet was enough to give that mouse worse asthma. So then they asked, well, was this somehow affecting the bacteria that normally live in the gut? We know that our diet very much shapes our commensal bacteria that live in the gut. So they asked that question in these mice. And as you can see here, there was a dramatic reduction in the number of bacteria from the Bacteroides family. And there was uh, likewise a significant expansion in Firmicutes. Well, it turns out that this uh, Bacteroides phyla, the bacteria from this phyla, are very, very good at fermenting dietary fiber into a metabolite called short-chain fatty acids. So they measured the concentration of these short-chain fatty acids and found that they were lower in mice in the, low, in the low fiber diet, both in the cecum, which is part of the intestine, as well as in the serum. So then they thought, well, maybe this decrease in short-chain fatty acids is why these mice on the low fiber diet are more likely to develop worse asthma. So to ask that question, they took mice, again, adult mice, all, all of them on a normal diet, and they gave half of them propionate, which is a type of short-chain fatty acid, and they gave the other half saline. And then they did their model of house dust mite, where they made the mice allergic or with asthma with um, house dust mite. And as you can see here, the mice that were injected with the short-chain fatty acid seemed to have less inflammation in their lungs. There was a significant decrease in those allergic cells uh, called eosinophils, and they also had lower Ig levels. So this suggested that simply altering the amount of one bacterial metabolite, short-chain fatty acids, is enough to prevent that predisposition to allergic disease. They went on to show that this protective effect was through short-chain fatty acids binding to their receptor called GPR41. And by doing that, it was increasing the production of dendritic cells in the bone marrow. Those dendritic cells were going back to the lung where they were less able to really induce this allergic type response. Well, those experiments were in mice. Is there any evidence that dysbiosis in humans can predispose to allergic disease? Well, there have been several epidemiologic studies that have suggested that many of the early life events that increase the risk of developing allergic disease later in life very much are likely to alter our intestinal microbiome including early exposure to antibiotics. So babies that are exposed to antibiotics either prenatally or shortly after birth tend to be at higher risk for developing allergic disease. Likewise, infants that are born by C-section tend to have a microbiota that very much resembles the mom's skin rather than her vaginal flora. And we know that these babies are also more prone to developing allergies. Children who grow up on a farm and are exposed to farm animals tend to be protected against allergies compared to those that grow up in an urban environment. This one's a little bit more controversial, but there is some evidence that infants who are breastfed may also be protected against allergies compared to those that are formula fed. And that's been attributed to a couple different things. It's known that breast milk contains different factors that can affect the growth of different species of bacteria in the gut. And breast milk itself may actually contain commensal organisms that can influence the initial colonization of the baby's gut. There's been a few studies showing that children who grew up in families with a pet, and it can't really be just any pet, it's really specific for dogs, may be protected against allergic disease. And then finally, there's data from the NHANES database, which is sort of a cross-sectional look at across the United States, both children and adults. 
and they found that higher levels of antimicrobial agents, including one called triclosan, in your urine is actually associated with an increased likelihood of being diagnosed with allergic disease. These people also had higher IgE levels. These things are everywhere. Triclosan is found in hundreds of bacterial products. If you go home and look in your medicine cabinet, I think there's a very good chance you will see it in your toothpaste, in your deodorant, in all those antibacterial soaps that you find everywhere. We're exposed to these things every day. So one of the largest studies to really look at this relationship between the microbiome in an infant and their subsequent risk of developing allergic disease later in life was, came from Canada. It was a Canadian Healthy Infant Longitudinal Study, or CHILD study. And this was a multi-center general birth cohort study. So basically, they just recruited 300 infants born in the general population at birth, and then they followed them through their first five years of life. And when the infants turned one year of age, they divided them into four different groups clinically. Those that they considered atopic and who had wheezing. So atopy was defined that they had a positive skin test to at least one of the most common food or environmental allergens. And wheezing, they had to have a doctor diagnosed episode of wheezing sometime within their first year of life. And then there were kids who just had atopy, so they only had positive skin tests, but they never had any episodes of wheezing those that had only wheezed, and then the controls, who had had neither of those. They collected stool from all of these infants at three months, and then again at one year of age. From other studies, we know that infants in this category, in the atopic wheeze category, are at very high risk of developing asthma later in life. And in this study, this group had almost a 20-fold higher risk of having asthma being diagnosed by a doctor at age three than those in the control group. And that really replicated what we already knew. However, this was a great opportunity to really ask, were there differences in the microbiome of these infants at three months compared to the controls? And that's what this data is showing here. So this is uh, ribosomal RNA sequencing. This is a way to look at what bacteria are present in the fecal matter from infants and in each of these different groups. This is uh, from fecal matter at three months of age. And when you just first take a look at it, just looking at the colors that are there, there was really no striking difference in the types of bacteria that were present. The overall composition was the same. But when you looked more closely, there were very big differences between the quantity or the, the diverse, the number of bacteria, relative quantity of bacteria in the controls and the atopic wheeze group. Perhaps even more interesting, this difference was only present at three months. When they looked at one year of age, there were no differences at all between these four different groups of patients. So whatever effect the microbiome is having on a child's subsequent risk of developing allergic disease it seems to be happening very early. I'm glad I knew that now and not when I was pregnant. So we talked earlier how short-chain fatty acids you know, can influence a child's risk of developing allergies. So they measured the concentration of these in those fecal samples from kids in the atopic wheeze group compared to controls. And as you can see, they did see a significant decrease in acetate, which is one type of short chain fatty acid. There were no differences in the other two that they measured, propionic and butyrate. But I think what this study really showed us is that, again, the composition of the intestinal microbiome very early in life, probably in the first few weeks to months of life, may actually be able to predict that child's risk of developing allergic disease years later. Well, as you can imagine, this has generated a lot of interest in trying to find ways to manipulate the microbiome in a way that we can prevent allergy. And I think the most common way that people have tried to do that is by using probiotics. You see these on the grocery shelves all the time. So what exactly is a probiotic? Well, the strict definition is that probiotics are living microorganisms which, upon ingestion of certain numbers, exert health benefits that go beyond general nutrition. And the most of the probiotics that have been used in clinical trials so far have really used bacteria that are similar to those that you find in a normal, healthy human intestine. So it's things like bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. Probiotics are thought to promote tolerance through several different mechanisms. It's known that different bacteria that normally live in the colon have different abilities to induce the development of those T regulatory cells, which we think are so important in tolerance, in part by increasing the levels of IL-10 and TGF-beta. As we talked earlier, other bacteria tend to be very good at making short-chain fatty acids and perhaps other favorable metabolites that might promote tolerance. 
And then bacterial products can also repair our gut barrier and increase IgA protection, uh, production, which we think may be protective. However, the results of most probiotic studies for allergic disease have really produced very dismal results. In fact, I don't know of any study where probiotics, when given as a monotherapy, so the only therapy, postnatally after the child's born, has had any benefit in either preventing or treating any allergic disease. There have been a few studies when moms were given the probiotic while she was pregnant and while she was breastfeeding, and they gave the baby a probiotic as soon as possible. There may be a very small benefit in terms of preventing the child's risk of eczema. But the results of these studies have been conflicting and the benefit so small that there really is just not sufficient data at this point to really recommend routine use of these agents. So why is this? Why have they not been effective? We think that the microbiome is so important. Why aren't probiotics working? And I think there's several possible explanations. One is that we may just not be using a high enough dose. In most of those studies, they didn't actually show that they were actually changing the composition of the microbiome when they gave the probiotic. So who knows if those bacteria were even alive or even able to compete with the bacteria that were normally present in the infant's gut. A second possibility is that we're simply using the wrong bugs. So maybe we should be using things like Clostridia or Bacteroides, which are stronger or better producers of ba bacterial metabolites that are more active in promoting tolerance. Another uh, procedure that you've heard about in recent years is something called fecal microbiota transplant. And this is exactly what it sounds like. So basically, you administer fecal material to a patient, either through an NG tube, a tube that goes down their nose and into their stomach, or during a colonoscopy. So this procedure was actually initially used to treat antibiotic-resistant C. difficile infections. And there was just very recently a randomized controlled trial showing its efficacy for this specific indication, and it's now used quite commonly. I am not aware of any published trials where they've used this for allergic disease, but there is a lot of interest in this, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about it in the coming years. So as you can see in this picture here, the composition and the diversity of the microbiome changes dramatically with age, from birth to adulthood. And some of the most drastic changes in diversity occur when we introduce solid foods at some time within the first year of age. What's really not clear, however, is whether earlier or later introduction of solid foods can help prevent allergic disease. So the recommendations regarding infant feeding practice have changed dramatically over the last few years. In 2000, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended that parents wait until their infant turns at least three years of age before introducing some of the more allergenic foods like peanut and fish, particularly if they had a sibling with an allergy or were at high risk for developing food allergy. In 2008, however, the AAP completely retracted that recommendation, in part because there was no evidence that withholding foods was actually curbing this sharp rise in allergic disease that was occurring during this time period. For example, the prevalence of peanut allergy was only 0.4% in 1997, and just 10, 11 years later, that had more than tripled. Currently, about over 2% of children have peanut allergy, and it is the number one cause of anaphylaxis and death related to food allergy in the United States. So around the time the AAP changed their recommendation, there were a few studies coming out that suggested that maybe we got it wrong, and really completely wrong. So in 2008, Detroit and colleagues who are in the UK showed that the prevalence of peanut allergy among Jewish children living in London, where it was standard practice for parents to avoid peanut until their child was three years old, was 10 times higher than among Jewish children living in Israel where it's common practice for infants to get exposed to peanut within the first few months of life. Almost all babies in Israel have peanut by the time they're six months old. There were similar results seen for milk allergy. The prevalence of milk allergy was only 0.05% among infants who had at least some exposure, not even just sole exposure, but some exposure to cow's milk within the first two weeks of life, compared to 1.75% if the infant wasn't exposed until after three months of age. And they saw similar uh, rates with egg allergy in, in Australia. Here, the odds of developing egg allergy were 1.6 to 3.4 fold higher if the child was first exposed to egg after 10 months of age compared to at four to six months of age. 
So to really rigorously ask and answer this question as to whether early introduction, specifically a peanut, into a child's diet could prevent the development of peanut allergy, Gideon Lack and his colleagues in UK did what's called the LEAP study, the Learning Early About Peanut Allergy Study. This was a randomized trial performed at a single site in the UK where they enrolled infants four to 11 months of age. And these were kids that were very high risk for developing peanut allergy. In order to be enrolled in the study, they had to have severe eczema, egg allergy, or both of those. So at their baseline visit, when they enrolled the infants at just a few months of age, they skin prick tested them to peanut, just to see where things stood. And I think surprisingly, a number of those infants were already sensitized to peanut. They already had IgE to peanut. They obviously weren't eating it at this age, but already a group of them, almost 100 of them, had had IgE to peanut, even though they, were, they had a negative uh, challenge to peanut. The rest of the infants were negative. Infants in both the groups were then randomly assigned to either peanut consumption, where they were told to eat at least six grams of peanut protein divided over three meals every week, or strict peanut avoidance, where they were to avoid all contact, any exposure to peanut whatsoever. And they had to do this for five years, until the child turned five years of age. So this was a long study. The children in the consumption group, for the most part, ate this snack food called bamba. This is what they were eating in Israel. Uh, this is a snack food that's made of puff corn and peanut. It looks a lot like a Cheeto. Uh, those of them that didn't like bomba could eat smooth peanut butter. So the primary outcome in this study was challenge proven peanut allergy at five years of age. And I think the results were really more dramatic than anyone could have anticipated uh, when they started with this study. So if you look at that cohort of infants who were initially negative, had a negative skin test to peanut, you can see here that the prevalence of peanut allergy in the group that was avoiding peanut was almost 14%. 14% of those kids went on to develop peanut allergy compared to only 2% in those that were eating peanut. Then when you looked at the cohort that already was showing they were well on their way to developing a peanut allergy, those who ate peanut, who were in the consumption group, were threefold less likely to develop peanut allergy. And where you look at a, what's called a per protocol analysis, we only look at kids who are doing exactly what they were told to do, you can see almost nobody who was in the consumption group went on to develop peanut allergy. This group followed uh, both skin prick test responses to peanut as well as peanut specific IgE levels over the course of the study. And one of the things that I found really interesting is that peanut IgE tended to increase over the five years in both the peanut avoidance and in the peanut consumption group. However, it was those kids who had true peanut allergy, shown here in the red, that had the highest levels of IgE to peanut, as you might expect, compared to those who are tolerant, which is shown in blue. They also measured the levels of IgG specific for peanut. And that's because there is data that IgG, and specifically IgG4, may be able to inhibit IgE-mediated responses through two different mechanisms. For one, this IgG can compete with IgE for binding to the allergen, and two, this Ig binds to inhibitory receptors on mast cells and basophils and can inhibit their activation. So when they measured IgG4 specific for peanut or all IgG subclasses specific for peanut, they found much higher levels in the group that was eating peanut compared to those that were avoiding. And the authors propose this may be one mechanism that accounts for why these children are more tolerant. I think overall though, the results of the LEAP study really I think have taught us that early introduction of food, and specifically peanut, may be able to effectively prevent the development of peanut allergy in infants that are high risk for developing the disease. Whether this is true for other foods and whether these kids will re remain non-allergic is something that still, I think, is an open question. But very exciting results, uh, at least from this one study. So somebody asked the question, well, what if I already have an allergic disease? Is there any way we can go back and reestablish tolerance after you've had the allergy? And I think one of a uh, very old strategy that attempts to do just that is something called allergen immunotherapy, or you might know it as allergy shots. Basically, with allergy shots, for those of you that haven't had them, you get injections of an allergen extract. Initially, these are given every week, and then they're sort of spaced out every two weeks and sometimes longer, but they're given over a period of three to five years. 
And this really has been remarkably effective at treating symptoms of hay fever and allergic rhinitis. Almost 70 to 80% of people who complete a full course of allergy shots show improvement in their symptoms. The mechanism behind that improvement is again uh, back to our cells called the T regulatory cells. So the T regs that are induced by uh, allergen immunotherapy are sought to suppress these effector cells that promote allergic responses. And that in turn prevents the activation and recruitment of other effector cells important in allergic responses. These T regulatory cells can also produce high amounts of IL-10, and this can cause isotype switching in B cells from primarily IgE to IgG, and specifically IgG4, which may have a blocking effect. So the concept of immunotherapy is certainly not a new treatment. Uh, allergy shots for grass pollen allergy were given at just the turn of the century. And since then, we've learned a lot more about the mechanisms, I think, by which allergen immunotherapy might improve symptoms. But it's really only been in the last few decades that immunotherapy for other allergic disease, including food allergy, has really come to light. They did actually try allergy shots for peanut allergy in the early 1990s. However, this led to very severe side effects, including one fatality. So that halted research into immunotherapy for food allergy for some time, until again very recently when newer strategies for delivering the allergen that cause fewer side effects have been developed. So I told you with allergy shots, the allergen is given under the skin, given subcutaneously. However, with sublingual immunotherapy or SLIT, the patients dispense a pre-measured amount of an allergen solution under their tongue and then hold it there for a few minutes before swallowing it. The idea with SLIT is that there are lots of cells in your oral mucosa that can promote tolerance. And so if we target that area, we can use lower doses of allergen and that might have fewer side effects. This has been used uh, in experimental trials for food allergy, but there is also what's called a grass tablet. They're using it to treat grass allergy. Oral immunotherapy is another strategy, uh, and this has really mostly been studied for food allergy, and it's probably the most promising treatment we have for food allergy currently. But with OIT, we actually feed the kids what they're allergic to. You start with really, really tiny doses, and then over the course of weeks to months, you gradually build up the amount of dose that they're getting. OIT has really been best studied for milk, egg, and peanut. As you might imagine, we're giving kids something they're allergic to, so side effects are extremely common, and that's why we start, again, with very low doses. Most of the side effects have been mild, usually oral itching or GI upset, but we certainly see anaphylaxis, and when a patient enrolls in this type of study, we're very clear that your child is going to react um, and potentially react very severely. So this has really only been done in medical settings. The good news is that the majority of patients, maybe as many as 70 to 80% of patients that complete OIT, are able to eat more of the food that they're allergic to at the end of the study than they were at the beginning. However, the majority of those kids also regain reactivity if they stop eating the food, sometimes just after a week. And that's very worrisome to us because it may be easy to eat things like milk every week, but if you get a GI virus where you're vomiting and you can't eat, you know, we worry about those kids a lot and will they redevelop their allergy. So we have a lot more work, I think, to do to really optimize immunotherapy for food allergy in order to really achieve what we would call lasting tolerance. So to summarize then, uh, allergic disease at a fundamental level seems to result from an inability or a defect in either establishing or maintaining tolerance to these innocuous antigens that are in our environment. Epidemiologic studies suggest that several early life events that are known to increase a child's risk of developing allergic disease later in life very likely may do so by altering the microbiome that normally lives in our gut. And then finally, allergen immunotherapy is a time-proven treatment for allergic rhinitis, and we're hopeful that it will be effective for other forms of allergic disease as well, including food allergy in coming years. Thank you. Thank you. I had a couple of questions. Uh, one, have there been any studies on introdu introduction of bee honey versus bee pollen and which is more effective? 
at mitigating hay fever. I know it's pretty specific, but. Mm -hmm. No, it's really interesting. I, I think the idea there is that when you're doing bee honey like that, you're actually doing immunotherapy because what the bee honey contains is actually pollen. Right. And so you're actually getting some exposure to the pollen. And so I, if it was a question whether bee honey or actually doing pollen okay. immunotherapy would be more effective, I think you know the immunotherapy would because you're just getting a larger dose of that pollen. And we think a larger dose may be needed to truly generate tolerance. Uh, thank you. And also, is it possible to have contact dermatitis in one mucosal surface but not another? So contact dermatitis is really uh, different than an allergy. And most of the time that's going to be through the skin, although you can see it in other mucosal sites as well. I, you know, usually I think of contact dermatitis as a skin reaction rather than um, a mucosal reaction. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Thank you. I'm just curious. Um, you're talking about the cellular level. Mm -hmm. What is there any connection with the brain and what it recognizes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an area that we really have a lot more to learn about. Is you know, all all our systems talk to each other, right. and there's no doubt that you know, mediators that are produced by immune cells are acting on the brain, okay? And, and perhaps the other way around, that, you know, when we have emotions, you know, that leads to changes in lots of metabolites in our body. When you talk about stress. I yes, exactly. Talk. And that's yeah. acting back on our immune system. So I think there is a lot of crosstalk between those systems, but I think we are just at the beginning of understanding how that works. I have a question about uh, why peanut? Is there something yeah. about peanuts or eggs? Is there something that they do to the bacteria in the gut around them? That, yeah. Or is it something about a protein so, sequence? Yeah, good question. So that's a big question is why are some foods allergenic and some aren't? And when you look at the class of foods that are allergens, they have several things in common. They tend to be water soluble, right? They send, tend to be resistant to heat and digestion. And in some cases, they remember, resemble Hellman's parasites, okay? Some allergens also resemble activators of our innate immune system, okay? So when you look at a group of allergens as a whole, those are some features that they all hold in common. But what's interesting is that what the most common food allergens are does differ in different parts of the world. And I don't know that that is so much a difference that, you know, let me give you an example. So peanut allergy, again, is very common in the United States, but rare in Israel. And in Israel, sesame allergy is very common. Is that a difference in genetics? Is that a difference in exposure? And I suspect that it's probably more related to environmental differences than it is to fundamental differences in the food. You know, I, I think it's interesting, uh, historically, to, we talked about this actually last week when the topic was uh, the microbiome and inflammatory bowel disease. But <clears throat> historically, uh, Mechnikov, who sort of started all this, pointed out that it was not possible to alter the composition. Now, this is 100 years ago, so they weren't doing all these fancy separations. But his point was it was impossible to alter the composition of the fecal bacteria by the oral route. Okay. Now, probiotics in a capsule are easy to sell. Mm -hmm. But I look, and I don't, maybe you can answer this, I hope. I don't know of any evidence that I've seen that any oral probiotic really does anything substantial to the flora. Mechnikov said, and actually did experiments, where he showed he could prolong longevity, which is what he was saying, well-being, not longevity, <laughs> well-being in rabbits, by giving them the, quote, probiotic, by the rectal route, mm -hmm. uh, not by the oral route. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't sell that too well in the commercial markets these days. Harder sell. But it may be coming. <laughs> yes. But would be. you comment about this? Because I think it's a serious, misleading uh, view that an oral probiotic is going to do anything. No, I agree with everything you say. I, it certainly hasn't been effective. And I, again, you know, there's several reasons for that. Whether they survive the gut you know, I think is a whole question. Um, and, and again, it could be dose. I, I think it really points to how important it is when we're doing these probiotic trials to really show that we've had an impact on the microbiota. 
Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, you know, connection that we're, we're altering that. The other question is, does the bacteria need to be alive? Or do these bacteria somehow stimulate the immune system in a way that, you know, augments a protective response? And I, I think that's more of an open question as well. But I think that's why there's a lot of people interested in the fecal microbiota transplants, where you're really just transplanting the microbiota where they need to be. They should survive. They're in an environment where they're used to living. And maybe that will be more effective than trying to take a pill orally. OK, any other questions? If not, I want to thank you both on behalf of all of us. This is really thank you. most enlightening. <laughs>